Hey, welcome students, teachers, and all of you who are interested in the American Constitution and uh, its place in uh, our daily lives. So this is Off the Cuff with the Four Bs, and uh, uh, we spend uh, our time together mainly because we enjoy each other's uh, company, but we also like to talk about the Constitution, American politics, uh, American history, and pretty much a lot of subjects that uh, you know uh, put eighth graders to sleep. So uh, again, <laughs> with some of our parenting skills that we're bringing uh, to the forefront here. Uh, today's session, um, we thought that, uh, you know we've talked about a lot of things over the months that we've been uh, meeting and discussing the Constitution. And we thought we'd kind of go back to the beginning a little bit and just talk about the general idea of, of constitutional understanding. So both today, what, what seems to be the predominant uh, view of the Constitution today through uh, the perspective of the four of us, how do we understand the understanding of the, uh, the, the constitutional founders and framers uh, and uh, what are the major maybe turning points uh, that bridge uh, uh, the past and present uh, in the constitutional understanding. And I think we would all agree that there might be, you know, historically no more important time in American history than, than the present uh, for Americans to have a solid understanding of our constitutional, its principles, its values, uh, and uh, its purpose um, as we confront, uh, in some ways, uh, some uh, very significant challenges especially amongst uh, you know, the, the general population. Uh, and uh, so we're hoping that we give you some insights and give you some uh, ideas uh, to think about. And, and, and again, one of the motivations, and I don't think this is anything new to uh, the four of us, but I was looking at some general assessments or studies of American uh, civic knowledge. Uh, one was the last NAEP, the National, Assess uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, Civics and Government uh, Assessment. And, it, it, and its finding was that 25% of 8th and uh, 11th graders, uh, if you kind of put those together, were proficient in civic uh, knowledge uh, and understanding. Uh, and then I found another stat that I found interesting that when we looked at surveys of the adult population, that 39% of the American adult population had a grasp, grasp or understanding of, uh, of the principle of separation of powers and its uh, purpose. Neither one of those statistics, I think, would make our hearts glow as far as the, uh, the, the insights and understanding of the American Constitution. And so much of our civic discourse is about the uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the constitutional principles and foundations. Uh, later on, uh, we'll be doing a segment on the Second Amendment uh, there, and uh, you'll get from this group uh, probably some really strong criticisms of the general knowledge that people have of the language and intent of the uh, Second Amendment, at least through our perspective. So what I'd like to start off with today is really to look at the snapshot of America in 2021. And not just our understandings, but really kind of focus on the misunderstandings. That is, what do we see? What do we know as uh, you know, as a group about uh, maybe some myths or misunderstandings that Americans have about uh, the American Constitution? Uh, there, uh, you know, and, and I'll start us off. Uh, you know, one of one of those that that again, and I think all of us who have taught. Uh, the subject, this is something that we, we try to clarify fairly early on, and that is the word democracy is not present in the American Constitution. Uh, and I, I do think it's an interesting uh, you know, discussion to have is, is how did we evolve from a constitutional republic uh, and uh, you know, I will defer in a minute to Professor Moore, but you know, my understanding is that the term republic would had been more off, often used in 1788 than the word democracy. Yet today, overwhelmingly, we describe ourselves as a democracy, and at least constitutionally, I find that uh, interesting, given that the word democracy uh, uh, is not in the document, and at least. Um, uh, in principle, there is, uh, 
there's a significant difference between a democracy as literally understood uh, and a republic uh, there. So that's, that's kind of my contribution to what I see as one of the major misunderstandings and one of the great con contributions to some high levels of frustration that a lot of Americans have because they think that the simple will of the people through a majority voice is, uh, is how we govern ourselves. And, uh, uh, and I, I think that uh, reveals some of a misunderstanding there. Uh, uh, Professor Moore, uh, what do you see as, as maybe a myth or a misunderstanding that most Americans have about our constitution? Well, I think, um... I think your point, actually, I'd like to um, continue your thought a little bit. Uh, I think in some ways um, it might be inevitable that this uh, trajectory of democracy that we're on, I mean, you think about the Declaration's insistence on equality, you know, all men are created equal. That's a, that's a remarkably powerful statement that I think sets us on the path to this um, this this uh, embracing and and uh, claiming uh, to be democratic, uh, whereas as as you uh, said, the Constitution is not. It's a filtered system, um, a Republican system that, that filters representation. So, so in a way, I, I couldn't help but think that there's a conflict between these two fundamentally important founding documents: one that has a democratic ethos, equality, and the other that doesn't. Uh, and uh, I think your point's well taken that we wrestle with that. Um, but the trajectory of democracy is a, is a powerful, has a powerful uh, well. And I, I might recommend um, the, the declaration is radical in that sense. And, it, and as, as we all know, that democracy was not seen by the founders as, that was a pejorative word, actually. Um, and so they worked fairly, and, and Madison looked at 1780s and said there was too much democracy. So I think your, um, your point's well taken that we do wrestle with those two ideas quite significantly. Um, I think our, my contribution to the uh, modern misunderstandings would be one um, is kind of a process misunderstanding and the other is a principle misunderstanding. Um, one, um, I'll start with the, 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 well, I don't know, maybe they're both <laughs> not that interesting. <laughs> The process misunderstanding is, I, I, I think a lot of people don't realize how difficult it was for us to get the Constitution. Um, the process of creating it in the summer of 1787, as well as the process of getting it approved. I, I, don't, I don't think many people really understand how difficult that was. And, and frankly, uh, how tenuous this uh, sacred Constitution was. It was uh, a very difficult process. I think uh, the other thing I would contribute that's a constitutional principle, I think along the lines of, of your thinking, David, is I, I think a lot of people think federal, uh, federalism is simple. <laughs> uh, that it's this uh, mathematical equation. There's the federal government, they do A, B, and C, and the state governments do you know, Q, R, and S, and, and there's this bright line uh, between national and local, uh, state and local governments. So I, I think a lot of people think that the Constitution uh, may have laid out that mathematical equation and federalism is a simple idea. And, and I would, I, to your, uh, again, to your points, your opening statements, uh, David, separation of powers, I think people see those as simple. Uh, checks and balances, I think they see those things as simple. And in the um, so I think the constitutional principles, I think, are misunderstood to be very easy to in their operation. You know, don't you find, uh, you know, again, all of us, well, three of us here, you know, are fairly, you know, rooted or grounded in, in a historical perspective. And then we've got our token political scientists uh, there. Uh, uh, and, uh, but, you know, I mean, is it, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, yeah, <laughs> that's part of the struggle of just teaching history is the, the concept, I mean, I, you know, getting a little bit more modernist, you know, I always found it a little bit difficult on the civil rights movement because the way you cover it in a junior year American history class is it seems like it happened within three days, you know, and, and trying to communicate them the long journey struggle, uh, you know, uh, to 1964, 65, of which is not the ending. 
uh, was always, uh, always, always a struggle. And I, I find that to be true. And I agree with you, Professor Moore, about the Philadelphia Convention through ratification. Uh, and really, this, <laughs> I think most Americans, and, and let me know if I'm wrong here, Tim, m most Americans don't really understand how close it was to not being yeah. ratified. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I think it was uh, Governor Morris at the convention that said, we'd better get this done quickly because the longer this goes on, the ratification he's speaking about, uh, that this should go quickly because the longer it goes, I think the, he, he was pressing enough to know that uh, the Federalists, those who supported the Constitution, were going to face an uphill battle. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think uh, in the first four or five, we're very quickly in Massachusetts uh, set a precedent that slowed the process down and, and interjected new issues into the ratification debate. So yeah, you're, you're right. It, it, uh, it, um, there was a lot of uh, hand-wringing in this uh, spring of 88 when, um, uh, when a couple of states did not um, you know, ratify as quickly as some of the early ones. Well, now that I've uh, you know, slammed the political scientists, let's get that perspective uh, there, <laughs> Professor uh, Williams. Uh, 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 myth or misunderstandings that you think uh, uh, are, uh, are prevalent uh, in, in America today? Yeah, I mean, I, I can build on what Tim just said in that, um, you know, in political science, we have a pretty clear definition of what a liberal democracy is, right? And it's a place where it's free and fair elections where everyone is allowed to vote, right? Based on just a minimal age requirement and civil liberties and civil rights are protected. And by that sort of just baseline definition, I, th I, think, um, I think what we celebrate on uh, July 4th or those of us that celebrate Constitution Day, you know, in September, um, I don't think we're as, as old a democracy as we like to tell ourselves we are. And um, I don't say that in a way to sort of be demeaning. I think it helps us understand the acuteness of the issues we're facing right now as a relatively younger democracy, rather than trying to convince ourselves that we're 240 plus years into an experiment of being a liberal democracy. So that's, that'd be the first one. Um, the second one, I want to I want to kind of build off what Tim said, but a little bit sort of, I don't think he meant it this way, maybe he did, but this idea of like the Declaration of Independence, it, he's absolutely right in that it, it gives us the words to start that are aspirational about equality, right? Um, he, he phrased it in a way kind of like it was a trajectory or a path that was then forged. And I would, I would push back a little bit and just say, I see the Declaration as the tool that those who have been marginalized and those who have not had their rights respected, it's been a tool for them to forge a democracy. I, I'm, I'm not one to understand the history of the United States as one that was linear or it's inevitable that we were gonna keep expanding rights. And I, and I don't think that's what Tim meant either. Um, it's been a struggle and it's been a struggle fought by those um, who didn't have rights, right? Whether we're thinking about women in Seneca Falls or we're thinking about abolitionists, we're thinking about Quakers, uh, transgender rights today. It's, it's always a battle and it's not, it's not something where we can just think it's gonna happen, right? There's gonna be steps in one direction and steps in another direction. So um, I think that is another myth that I would see is that we tend to think, okay, so we haven't been in democracies for 240 years, but it was inevitable that we would become one because the Declaration, the Constitution. Um, I don't think that's the case, and I don't think it's inevitable that we were, are going to stay one. Um, and then my final, I guess, myth that I'd bring up is that um, our Constitution was set up at a time to deal with issues of the, of the 18th century. And if we just think about the last 30, last, no, let's go last 20 years, right? 9-11, war on terror, great recession, pandemic, racial justice, new a kind of a, a new civil rights moment, right? And I think it's a fundamental question just to ask, are the institutions that were set up in 1787, 1789, 
are they the best structures to respond to these sort of modern day issues? Or, or is it a user error, <laughs> right? Is this system fine, but we just don't have the right political leaders who are using the system in the way it was supposed to be used? I, I just think it's remarkable that if we go back, you know, 25 years, we've had three impeachments. We've had two elections where the popular vote and the electoral vote didn't match up. One of those elections was decided by the Supreme Court. And, um, and we've seen federalism in action with the pandemic. So all these main structures have, we have this like laboratory of seeing how they've worked and not worked um, the last 20 to 30 years. Mike, I, 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 I wanna check in with you because you mentioned something that uh, uh, again, as, as, as I interact with people today, and, and that is I'm wondering in the courses you teach in which this concept of liberal democracy comes up, yeah. do most of your students or and again, and it can be just general people that you come across, do they understand, do they, do they understand the term liberal as, um, as you intend? No, not, no, that has to be explained. You're absolutely right. So it's not a capital L liberal. It's not like a Ted Kennedy liberal. It's liberal in the sense of small L, a belief in individual rights, individual political rights, the right to information. You're, you're absolutely right. They don't. Well, and I, you know, I, in a lot of the literature that I, I read this week, you know, they talk about the, the, you know, or the decline of liberal democracy or the rise of illiberal uh, 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 government kind of stuff. And I, part of me chuckles because at least in the community that I live in, just the very use of the word liberal is, yeah. is going to have in some cases much different reactions than I think the 18th century obviously uh, right. uh, would have. And it, it, it's one of the barriers civic educators have to overcome is, is, is making sure there's some clarity well, about that concept. Well, well, exactly. In Zakaria's book on this that I think is 20 years old now, I used to use that in my classes as a way to teach students about how other societies were getting democracy, quote unquote, wrong because they were creating illiberal democracies. And I think now is that like, I can see now using that text in my course to just reflect on the United States itself, right? And I don't think that's what Zakaria actually meant when he wrote it, but I think that that's how it can be used now. Mr. Kavanaugh. Wow, I, yeah, I've got a lot to digest there. Um, I do like the fact, David, that you actually threw some st statistics in about adults because it, as a, a high school teacher, it's a little frustrating that when high school kids get thrown under the bus when they're no different than most of the adults walking the street. So I appreciate that. Um, I do think, and, and Mike used the word and Tim addressed it, uh, and it reminded me of uh, uh, Joanne uh, Freeman. I was listening to her talk about, you know, none of this was inevitable from the writing of the document to the ratification of the document to its implementation. We, we look backwards and we think there's this degree of inevitability. There's this divine providence and it was not inevitable. And there've been many times when, uh, not many times, but there've been times when we've been on the precipice about the inevitability of our continuation of our Republic. So I, I do appreciate that because nothing is inevitable. Nothing's written in stone. Um, I do think, though, I want to push back a little bit because if I if I teach my students, I said if someone asks you what type of government we have, I always tell them the best answer is a federal democratic republic, and and I understand you know I absolutely agree with with Tim about the idea that democracy they were worried about too much democracy, Sea Shades Rebellion, right, or Woody Holton's great book Unruly Americans, um, which I don't have here to hold up, sorry, um, but. Even Madison understood that there was going to be a degree of the democratic process, not what we think of, right? Not, not the aspirational democracy that Tim alluded to in the declaration, but that at a certain point, there will have to be people that will have to elect representatives. Now that number will be small and that will be a very refined thing, but it does plant the seed to expand that. So I, I do think there, I mean, I, 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 federal democratic republic is the best way to try and teach a high school kid to describe the type of government that we have today. Um, maybe not exactly what the framers gave us, but that's kind of where we are right now. Um, I was just listening to you guys speak, and I just got, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but uh, I've been showing my class this great film called All the Way. It stars Brian Cranston as LBJ, Anthony Mackie as MLK, fantastic film 
looking, picking up right after uh, Kennedy's assassination and looking at getting the, uh, the Civil Rights Act through. And there was a scene that we watched just today, and it was um, James Cheney's funeral, one of the uh, gentlemen that was killed in Neshoba, uh, Mississippi. And, you know, Dr. King is giving the eulogy and actually a, a gentleman in the crowd got up and said, no, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm not going to be, it's not about forgiveness. It's not about turning the other cheek anymore. I'm angry and I want vengeance. I have vengeance in my heart, not forgiveness in my heart because I'm tired of watching white men kill black, or excuse me, white men kill black men and not be punished for it. And so it makes me think about, you know, the inevitability, we're, we're, you know, that this long journey that we're still on. So I'm, I'm not sure how that relates to the original question, David, but it just seems like we are just still on this long process of, of trying to going all the way back to the declaration and the aspirational sense of the declaration being our North star in terms of equality, in terms of like, I think myths or misunderstandings in addition to that, you know, the idea that, Oh, well, we can pass the 14th amendment or we can abolish slavery or bam and everybody's happy, which is clearly not the case. Um, I think one of my biggest frustrations is the lack of knowledge of which branch has which power. And, and certainly in a more modern sense, you know, for us, we know going back to maybe FDR, but even presidents before that, Lincoln, obviously during the Civil War, but the, the expansion of executive power and the fact that we are, as a, as a population, we're just, we're more than happy to accept it, right? More than happy to accept the president taking action you know, and, and doing things that really should be congressional in nature, but we don't know because, or we don't care because we don't know. I don't know. Is that ignorance is bliss? Maybe. I don't know. So this is what I think one of my biggest frustrations and maybe one of the biggest disconnects for me is uh, what, who, who should be doing what in terms of at the federal level. One thing I'd like to, to, to add, and again, this was uh, one of those that uh, um, would uh, bring out uh my more passionate side in the classroom. Uh, and I think all of us are very aware of this, this, I don't even know if we call it a conversation, but there, there is, there has been a, a, a developing cottage industry uh, within what I'll call the Christian right uh, to develop a history that, uh, uh, and, and I think one of you used uh, the term divinely inspired constitution, uh, that this is a Christian document and we are a Christian nation in a constitutional sense. And one of the things I, you know, I ask kids to do is, you know, okay, if that's the case, and we've, it, and usually we've talked about that they were prone to write things down, uh, show me where in the constitution, contrasting that with some state constitutions where they were very upfront about the, the religious uh, uh, element to their, their state constitutions. Uh, so, you know, one of the misunderstandings or myths is, is this notion of a Christian constitutional arrangement uh, or that we're a Christian country uh, uh, somehow ordained, divinely ordained by God. And it seems to me if that were, were the case, we would have said that and you will find the word God nowhere uh, uh, in, in the constitution if, if I've read it uh, uh, correctly uh, there. So let's contrast, you know, let's contrast what some of these things we've seen as misunderstandings or myths to 1788. And I, I've got kind of a couple of different uh, perspectives there, or, or I guess topics or, or ways I want to see if we can approach. One is about rights. And one of the things that, that and especially Mr. Kavanaugh has been very consistent about is that rights are not absolute. Um, uh, the other thing I, I, that I, that's, as if we contrast the two periods in history, all right, the, the more contemporary versus 1788 is I don't know to what degree written rights were a, were a centerpiece of the constitutional arrangement um, of the framers. And, and whereas we are so rights conscious uh, now, and I, and, and I always refer to this, if you guys remember uh, back in the bicentennial year, 1987, uh, there was... There, I, and I can't remember the source, uh, but uh, I, there was a source that talked about a survey done in 1900 compared to a survey done like in 1986 or, or maybe it was 1976 
where Americans are asked kind of what is the centerpiece? What's the most important thing about uh, our, our constitutional system? And of course, whether it was 1976 or 1986, I, I'll be honest, I can't remember, it was rights. Yet in 1900, it was separation of powers uh, there. And so Mr. Moore, since this tends to be, you know, would you agree with that, that in 1788, would it have been, where would rights have been as far as a, a valued element of the written constitution? Would it have been placed, you know, as number one or? Um, well, uh, it, it might depend if you're talking to a federalist or an anti-federalist. Um, <laughs> and, and if uh, if you want to break, because uh, the, the short answer is, the Federalists would have argued uh, rights shouldn't be in the equation. Don't worry about it. Uh, we have a constitution that doesn't have a bill of rights. No big deal. Don't worry about it. Whereas uh, the anti-Federalist argument is, hey, wait a minute. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we come from a British tradition where, uh, you know, rights of Englishmen were always talked about. And we now have a, national, a new national constitution and um, it needs a bill of rights. Now, having said that, there were some anti-federalists that could have cared, well, not cared less, but were more concerned about structural arrangements in the Constitution than they were rights. And so there was some division within the anti-federalists on the Bill of Rights, whether it was necessary or not, because some of them really felt like they, they were, uh, some anti-federalists were short-sighted in insisting on a Bill of Rights. The real issue it wasn't a lack of Bill of Rights, it was the powers that were in the Constitution that were the problem. So to, to answer your question directly, David, it depends on who you talk to, and there's a subdivision in it with, within, <laughs> within one of those groups as well about whether rights were important or not. Well, okay. and, and Madison and Madison in the first Congress knows full well that uh, if they don't get a Bill of Rights, there's a uh, distinct possibility that there'll be a second convention. Uh, so he he really pushes hard in the first Congress to get that Bill of Rights through and sent to the states. So, so what do you see, Professor Moore, as the greatest contrast between this generation's understanding of the Constitution and the founding generation's understanding of the Constitution? Where where do you see the greatest gap, uh, you know, <laughs> between those understandings? I know that's probably too big of a question and uh, stuff. <laughs> you but, think? Uh, yeah. It, well, you know, uh, well, again, part of me goes to the notion of rights myself, yeah. that we're so rights conscious that we've forgotten that rights, as, as understood in our constitutional arrangement, were themselves in the context of a social contract. And it was a two-sided coin that with rights came responsibilities. Um, I don't hear a lot of that and, and, you know, and we can get into, obviously, some very current subjects wearing a mask. Uh, we don't hear a lot about responsibilities uh, uh, today. And so, so in my view, probably one of the greatest contrasts and, and, and over the, the evolving Constitution, if we want to address it that way, uh, is that it seems that the notion of the responsibilities implicit, to me, there's responsibilities of citizenship within the Constitution, there's the responsibilities of representation in the Constitution. Um, that seems to have been lost, and today's discussion is overwhelming about rights, rights, rights. So to me, well, that's I, one of the biggest gaps. I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to push back on that a little bit, David. I'm not sure that the Constitution actually addresses the issue of responsibilities at all. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious by your use of the phrase responsibility of representation. Um, I, 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 maybe I missed that in, in uh, some of my readings, but, uh, but the, I think, but to your point about the emphasis on rights and the neglect of responsibilities is fair, but I guess I might say responsibilities is less a constitutional category of, of stuff more than a, almost a moral category of stuff. Um, so, and and the way I read the Constitution, there's it doesn't it's not a treatise on morality, whereas I think responsibilities is more in that zone than constitutional, um, and certainly rights. Uh, I know the argument was made uh, that with every right there is a responsibility, and I um, and I actually agree with that, but I don't know that that's a constitutional argument more than a cultural moral argument. Well, and and I would agree with you that uh, you know. Uh, 
that I'm probably I'm probably focused uh, on more philosophical foundations and th- you right. know than I than I am textual uh, language sure. there. But when I talk about responsibilities of represent representatives, I think we get into that whole Burkean you know notion oh, sure. of what right. what is. Yeah, and there's a deep yeah. Then there's a deep well of history on the responsibility piece um, that is there, and that that dates back to the ancient um, the ancients and uh, in, in the classical republicanism. So sure. Yeah, I think Mr. Dave to, Dave to address your question I, or your original question to Tim about this gap, right? That yeah. that could have filled like all of our broadcasts. Um, I keep thinking of like uh, Tocqueville. And uh, for those people that are new to us, Alexis de Tocqueville was a Frenchman who wrote a, a seminal work called Democracy in America uh, after touring the country and, and talking to a lot of folks. And I think he makes a comparison between us being a new country under a constitution, very new. And we're like that, you know, I'm, I'm this, he doesn't say this, but, you know, we're like that new kid on uh, with a new toy on Christmas and we're just going to play with it. For and you know, we were until we get completely bored with it, and then we become like the Europeans, where we just get apathetic about things. We'll let somebody else worry about it because I'm too busy living my life, right? Um, I think this kind of that's I think that's part of the issue in terms of you're talking about this gap, and now this, you know, maybe it goes back to that sense of in, in, inevitability that this was just ordained and somehow it's just going to just going to continue to go on uh, one of the scholars of the network robert diane from uh, university of evansville talked about ron popeel's uh, uh rotisserie oven it's like he said you, you can't set it and forget it right you can't just walk away from from the republican system lowercase r set up by the constitution and i think that's what's kind of the way that we've gotten to a degree perhaps until this last election when you look at the numbers and the turnouts in this last election, yeah. but you've seen a great deal of apathy, which reminds me of Tocqueville, uh, you know, kind of talking about how great we were when, you know, in the 1820s and 1830s, when it's still relatively new and how apathetic the Europeans are. And now have we become like the Europeans Tocqueville wrote about? I, maybe, I, maybe. Mike? Yeah, I wanted to chime in here on this, um, both those comments, but this idea of rights and power or what we would call in political scientists like rights versus state capacity, the ability of the government to actually enforce rights. I think that's a major difference if I dare play historian here for five seconds. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is it almost up? <laughs> and, Time's up. And, um, I mean, back at the founding, I don't think there was the intention nor the state capacity for the federal government to enforce many of the rights that were in the Bill of Rights. You are correct, sir. So, and that's interestingly, you know, you know, I do comparative politics and a lot of developing democracies, that's, that's a problem, right? They put things on paper, but then they don't have the capacity to do it, to actually do that. What I find interesting today is that I think we, I would argue that the United States today as a government has the capacity if they chose to use it, right? Um, but I think there's been some public policy decisions the last 30 or 40 years where a lot of that state capacity has been purposely sort of um, hollowed out. Uh, yeah. And so we or we see governments doing the exact opposite of using their state capacity to maybe limit rights. Right. So I think we're at a different stage of development. But I still think that if you're if you're a marginalized person in the United States, defined however broadly you wanted to say. I think um, you still have some argue, how do I want to say it? To be marginalized in 1787, it was a different set of problems than to be marginalized today. It's, you still may feel marginalized and the, the government's not acting to protect your interests, but it's for different reasons. Like we have the capacity to do much more than we actually do. And I, I find that that then leads to the question of, okay, then why? <laughs> And that gets into me more questions of political culture, um, how we view what government should be doing, what's legitimate. Um, that idea of rights and power, I think, is is excellent, Tim. So thanks for bringing that up. Well, and I think to me, Mike, building off of that, that the whole notion of of power itself is one of the biggest gaps because, and again, please slap me around if I'm wrong here, but 
my view of, of the 18th century and, and what they were focused on in Philadelphia and in ratification was kind of the, and I try to, you know, the, the dissemination of power and, and, and making sure that that power is, is not centralized in, in a, a single hand or even a small group. Whereas I see the trend today that, that both in, in, again, you guys from uh, the great Midwest, I'm sure you followed some California issues, you know, California's obsession with uh, recalling the governor and uh, blaming the governor for every ill uh, that we have. And the same thing with the presidency, you know, the evolution of the executive branch in this country and Americans comfort, whether it is foreign or domestic policy with presidents just pretty much, you know, kind of doing their thing, you know, to me seems to be one of the, again, the key gaps in, you know, our, our constitutional culture where they were very fixated on yeah. <laughs> making sure that didn't happen. It seems today we're pretty comfortable with, uh, with unitary executive power. I don't know. Am I, am I wrong there or how do you No, guys- I, you're, you're spot on there. I mean, the growth of, uh, I mean, uh, Arthur Schlesinger and the growth of executive power, uh, the, uh, the imperial presidency starting uh, early 20th century. Um, and, and bear in mind, culturally, there were a lot of intellectuals in America that saw uh, fascism as the route to go, uh, which I think, um, for better or worse, you know, those two uh, rivers kind of came together there um, during the Depression. And, and so, so the, the legacy of the creation and perpetuation of executive power is certainly, uh, <laughs> the founders would say, uh, no. Uh, in fact, they got so obsessed with the uh, legislative power that bi- bicameralism became uh, the default there uh, in their fears about legislative power. So, yeah, I think they would scratch their head at the executive. Well, uh, I'm going I'm to push back just a little bit. I, I absolutely agree with you, David. That's why I brought it up earlier about the, what people don't understand about congressional power versus executive power. <laughs> but I think that right now, right, right at this very moment in our history, uh, we want strong executive power for our guy, right? Not for the other guy, not for the other team. We just want it for our guy, <clears throat> whether, that, whether that be the former president or the current president, depending on which way your twig is bent. We want that strong executive, but we don't want the other team to have the strong executive. We want him to be weak because for some reason, he's not the Wizard of Oz that we want. We want the Wizard of Oz from the other county over the other, you know, we want the guy from the other team. So um, I think that, yeah, I mean, uh, Ted Lowy, a really <coughs> great historian, presidential historian said that everybody wants the president to be the Wizard of Oz, right? To reach in that black bag and have something for everybody. But uh, right now, I think we're so polarized and divided on things uh, politically that, um, we only want a strong executive if he's got our 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 or our D in front of him. You think that's really we're really that different from the 1830s or the the 1850s or you know uh, uh, you know uh, the early you know the early turn of the century? No, I, I think there are people we have been divided. I'm just talking about in terms of like executive power, right? In terms of like because I think if you go back to the, those time frames. I mean, holy cow, look how Andrew Jackson was chastised for, you know, the National Bank. And, you know, the, we've all seen the famous editorial cartoons of King Andrew, you know, standing on co- ripped up copies of the Constitution and with his royal scepter. So, you know, th- we've always had there's always been political division. But in terms of like uh, wanting that strong executive, but there, I mean, I think that's a I think that's a more of a modern uh, concept, a construct maybe coming out of the New Deal. Well, maybe. I mean, in, in terms of looking at another difference, Chris, um, this, this idea of we want it for our guy, right? I mean, that is, you're, you're talk, we're talking about political parties, right? Yes. Not that the, I'm not, I'm not gonna make the argument the founders didn't realize they were making political parties because I think they probably did, but the power to which parties have today and the extent to which there's a lack of trust that the president can be the president for all of us, regardless of the party affiliation. I don't know, Tim, I, am I romanticizing the extent to which Americans early on really did believe the president would be for all of them? Or was it always through sort of like a partisan lens, even from the beginning? 
Well, even uh, even the extreme deference that Washington received as that guy that could do that, uh, that very quickly fades, even even within the middle of Washington's first administration and certainly continuing into the second. Uh, so the partisanship, um, w there was tremendous deference within the first two years, but I think the policies coming out um, of, of uh, the Washington administration uh, ended that pretty quickly. Well, let me let me let me rephrase it. Let me use a different word. How about like consistency? So that knowing that okay, so we've got one guy in from one term or whatever from one party, and he's going to be followed up, or eventually she will be followed up with somebody from the different party, and. It, historically speaking, was there a greater consistency of, uh, yes, okay, uh, our team did this, so your team should be able to do this too? Because right now, it seems that we don't have that consistency of political philosophy or political foundation, right? We're going to just go whichever which way we want to spin the dial whenever, right now. Is that, I don't know if I'm, that's making sense or not. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, to, I, I, I don't think it's changed, Chris. Uh, you know, okay. I, I, and again, probably I'm being too simple, but I think about Hamilton and Jefferson, uh, you know, and, and, and at least how it's portrayed, you know, in, in history books and stuff, you know, is, is kind of calling each other out. You know, uh, Jefferson becomes more Hamiltonian as president. Uh, Hamiltonian becomes more Jeffersonian when Jefferson's become, pre you know, that that I don't I, I again, I just I just don't know if that's changed as far as, you know, my team can do this, but your team can't. I, I think that is, I think we're much more. It's much more. I, and again, I, I, well, I was going to say, I think it's much more intense today. But then I refer back to some of the yeah. newspaper newspaper articles and and uh, editorials of uh, eighteen hundred, and maybe they're not as uh, more we're, we're not more vitriolic than they were well, uh, maybe, back then. Uh, Professor or uh, Professor Williams. Well, I just want, maybe the framing of, of this then is um, you know in political science we talk about democratic consolidation, which is this weird concept that kind of feels like oh we did it we're a democracy we can just relax, which is. As Chris said earlier, it's an ongoing process for every country, right? But when thinking about a consolidation process, one of the factors is if you lose political power, do you have faith that you could get political power again? Like that's part of the legitimacy. And so if you lose, you're pissed, but you kind of figure, okay, we can get power back. And I, th I think to me, that's the, I don't have the answer, but that's kind of the question to the extent to which Jefferson, Adams, Washington, they were dealing with that question as much today as the Republicans and Democrats are thinking about that. And how every political elite is gonna try to rig the system <laughs> fairly as possible to get access to power, but do you have faith that it's not gonna be completely closed off? I mean, to me, that seems to be what may separate a democracy from a non-democracy because when you're closed off from power then the game's kind of up in terms of the legitimacy of the system i think that's at the heart of constitutionalism isn't it the idea that uh, access to the poll you know free and fair elections and and uh, i mean i think that's one of the basic i'm just i'm just checking something here written by john patrick just to make sure i'm understanding him correctly and i think that's exactly what he's talking about uh, means of electing and appointing government officials, right? And that's at the heart of constitutionalism, small, small c, any constitution. So yeah, that's a great point, Mike, in terms of uh, being able to say, okay, we won this one, we can get the next one, or we lost this one, we can get the next one. Yeah. Kind of like the Dodgers. I was thinking the Dodgers, same thing. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I'm not going to take the bait on that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, is it fair to say that one of the areas of, of consistency uh, in which the gap might not be so big is the area of federalism, that the discussions, understandings, and debates about the federal system in 1800 are really not that much different uh, than they are in 2021? 
Professor Moore? I, 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 I absolutely agree. I mean, just yeah. just today, how many how many governors have said they're no longer going to take uh, COVID relief money because they believe it's hurting their employ unemployment figures? So governor after governor, primarily Republican governors, I've yet to see a Democratic governor come out and say this, but they said that they're no, no longer going to accept uh, federal COVID relief money, right? Because they don't want to be beholden to the national government for this uh, largesse that they think is coming down. So I think it's absolutely the way it was then. I mean, I would agree. I mean, the, um, I mean, there's a there's a a school of thinking that says there's really one issue in American history, and it's federalism. And I and I um, I generally subscribe to that. I mean, even even the the bank bill in the 1790s, there was a federalism component to that because a lot of the state banks <laughs> saw a, this uh, behemoth national uh, nationally chartered bank uh, as a threat. So. Um, so the, the, yeah, the federalism component, I would say, has always been there. And I, and I think to your very first question, what is our mis, um, misunderstandings? I think we, we don't understand how vigorously they fought over federalism at the, in the founding period uh, as much as, as we still do. Uh, it's not a uh, – and those fights were just as visceral, uh, I, I would suggest. Well, and I'm, I'm wondering, Tim – I mean, was was the, the federal system they designed just kind of happen chance because of that visceral debate? It just kind of it formed and it, it, it itself just because of the intensity or. No, or I, I would say federalism. Uh, we inherited federalism from the British. Uh, you know, they they had this. Uh, I would call it British federalism. Uh, so, so the division of power uh, vertically was around. We inherited that. We certainly, uh, at the convention, when we were creating our constitution, we always had to keep our eyes to whatever the, you know, the, the, the states were going to hold the national government hostage on various policies, slavery being one of those. Uh, so we inherited this federalism and this tremendous uh, sets of so arguments that preceded us as a country about federalism. So what were the visceral arguments all about? What were the intents? Are if, if everybody understands we're going to have a federal system and divide power vertically between the state and national government, what are, what what's the hostility or angry debates all about then? Because some of them overlapped, uh, and also if you're an anti-federalist, you're always suspicious of uh, national power. Mr. Williams, I couldn't tell if you were leaning in there to say something or uh, uh, just giving us a better look at your pretty face. No, I think this is I think this is spot on. And I'm I mean, Tim, you started off the discussion by saying one of the myths was you didn't people don't understand how difficult it was to pass the Constitution and how tenuous it was. And by spotlighting the federalism issue, to me, it's just one step away of spotlighting the are we a union or not? Like, yeah. and, and to say that it was tenuous in 1787, what I'm hearing the argument is it's, it's still tenuous today. And that if we just spot check through history, what have been the major violent sort of reactions, right, to federal power, it has been around federalism and, um, I don't know. I just, it's a really good point because I see it connecting the political identity, which, which I think is super important. Well, you know, if, if power is finite, right, which I, I believe it is, right, unless you're getting into, you know, higher supreme being kind of argument, which I'm not going to. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's always going to be a urinating contest to see who can get the power whether it's going to be at the state level, whether it's going to be at the national level, whether, you know, uh, if the Congress is not going to use it, the president is certainly going to come in and take it. So, and I think it goes back to the idea of federalism. You know, we we're doing this dance at the convention. You know, you've got to have one eye, and as Tim just said, you're going to have to have one eye or one ear on what the states will allow and will accept, and you're going to push up that line. Oh, by the way, you might brand yourselves as the Federalists because, yeah, we're more federal than you because we know how this, and oh, don't worry about it. We know the states are going to still have all their power. So, um, you know, but it's still just an argument over sovereignty. 
to steal one of Tim's words. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I just, I can't help but think about um, the South African case, right? With like 11 different ethnic groups, um, it would have been very easy for them to say, let's create a federal system where all the different ethnic groups can have a certain amount of power. But in 1996, they decided to create a, a more of a confederal or a unitary system. And it was largely because those who had been, the majority who had been marginalized during apartheid said, we want to concentrate power because we want to change things. And I, I'm just thinking about the federal system, its origins. I'm stepping on history. It's like to protect certain very discernible interests at the local level. And if we see federalism through that, and if we were to, if we were to have a convention today, would those segments of the US population who are marginalized or who are low income, would they desperately want a, uni a unified system so that there could be a concentration of power to actually address the inequitable sort of situation that has been brought about because federalism was all about protecting some very, I don't know, discrete interests. Well, that, that was the history. They were all local, they were all local entities. And so they're going to inherit that desire to maintain uh -huh. local control, local identity, local policy making. Uh, that, that's the nature of them being colonies and separate from each other. Right. There's no, there's no American. <laughs> uh, these are all separate entities. And so we inherit that and that drives, uh, for better or worse, we inherit that federalism, that, that supposed bargain between the national and the uh, and the states and, it, and it's all white americans protecting yeah. different means of livelihood at the time that right was, I, right okay. you know, that's why i always go back to that uh, as i've done on other broadcasts is that last paragraph of the declaration right as free and independent states you know as free and independent states the states have the ability to levy war conclude peace contract alliances uh um, um uh, and do everything free and independent states have by right have power to do. So in essence, they created, I think what Hamilton may have called like 13 petty republics, but um, you know, that's Hamilton, but that, yeah. So we've been wrestling with that idea, you know, ever since. So you create a stronger national government under the constitution, but we're still going to allow you to hold on to some of these powers. And again, this is a battle over sovereignty. Um, it's, and, and, you know, you see it, uh, throughout our history, whether you want the national government to come in and, and do certain things, especially in the civil rights movement, or not. Um, I mean, it, it, the, I hate to go back to this movie again, but you saw they showed the filibuster against the Civil Rights Act. And, you know, the Southern Democrats were arguing that this was a violation of the Constitution, because now um, their federal government is going to tell them who they have to serve in their business, and they don't want to have to do that. So if I think I think there's amongst us, there, there's a consensus that the understanding of the Constitution has changed uh, in, in some areas, it's changed drastically, in some areas, maybe not so much. And every one of our segments is, is you know, we get into a discussion in constitutional history, um, but I'd like to kind of give our audience and, and students a, a highlight. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's this notion of turning points in history. What would you guys identify as a key turning point or turning points in this, this changing understanding uh, of the Constitution uh, uh, throughout American history? And, and obviously, it's going to continue, I would imagine, uh, to do so uh, uh, there. So, Professor Williams, what, what do you see? When in history do you see a, a key turning point uh, in, in this notion of understand. Let me guess. Let me guess. <laughs> <laughs> the softballs and lined up. Um, yeah. I think, it's, I think we go to 60, 1964, 1965, back to the understanding of what a liberal democracy is. Um, it's the first time in American history where there's actual free and fair elections that are universal, that the government is going to protect everyone's right to participate. So... I, for me, that's, to me, that's the beginning. It's not the end point, right? It's the beginning point of our constitutional democracy. And right now we're just 50 plus years old trying to, trying to learn how to live with each other. 
isn't it just a fulfillment of the turning point of reconstruction? I mean, in economics, there's these thing called indicators, right? Uh, 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 lagging indicators, coincidental indicators. Isn't 64, 65 just a lagging indicator of what was put in motion 100 years earlier? We got, but you, you didn't want me to take away all, you didn't want me to talk about all the turning points, right? <laughs> no, I didn't uh, there. <laughs> If the, if the declaration is the rhetoric without the state capacity, the, right. the reconstruction is the state capacity with the rhetoric, but then no one's going to use that state capacity until we get to 64 and 65. That's how I would connect. It. Okay, that 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 brings clarity. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh? Well, um, thanks for not, not pushing him on this because I was going to go with the 14th Amendment. So um, I, I think that in terms of federalism through the the doctrine of incorporation uh which obviously we know takes a while and we, i know, what, you know the 14th amendment is ratified in, in 1868 um but you know it's not until gitlow versus new york in 1925 that we actually get the bill of rights beginning to be incorporated through the 14th amendment but uh thurgood marshall said it in an article when over the bicentennial and people were all celebrating the constitution back to David, what you had said earlier about being ordained by God and this, you know, divinely influenced. And, and uh, Thurgood Marshall said the constitution did not survive the civil war in its place was a new document. And I think that we finally start to, to reach, reach back to the declaration of independence and that idea that Tim started us with, and that is one of equality. Now, granted in 1868, we are a long, long way away from it. Reconstruction had that followed through with it could have completely changed American history, but we didn't. And we know after the Hayes Tilden debacle that all bets were off and we're back to Jim Crow and the Klan running the South. Well, some of the South. So, but I, I like the 14th Amendment. And I, I, what I, you know, I found interesting here is, is both Chris, you and Mike have focused on turning points that tend to focus on rights. The Civil Rights Act is 64, 65, the 14th Amendment and the rights. So I'm going to take a different- That's why point. you're the leader, Dave. You know, That's uh, why you're the leader. Well, I think rights are overrated. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm going to take a different tack. To me, I think probably for for the modern era, and yeah, we're still, we're in a debate about it, but I, I think the New Deal, I think the radical transformation of federal economic power as, and, uh, you know, uh, enforcement power uh, there uh, is, is a key turning point in understanding the Constitution and or how we understand the Constitution today, especially if we look at, at, at Biden's, uh, you know, plan to build back better, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure and things like that. Well, uh, before the New Deal, you know, I don't, you know, at any generation before the New Deal, they would, and then if you look after, they would not recognize America, uh, you know, a after that. So, uh, you know, so that's, that's what I would, you know, make sure that students and teachers kind of focus on is how the New Deal, because I, I do believe, Chris, that it gets underrepresented in constitutional discussion uh, there. Uh, so, uh, you know, and again, that wasn't a criticism. I, I think you and Mike reflect the kind of the, the modern cultural view of our constitution. It's about well, let me, rights. Let me, let me push back just a tad on that, David. I absolutely agree that the, the New Deal is pivotal, pivotal, sorry, in, in terms of understanding where we are today, especially <laughs> when people are talking about uh, Biden and what he wants to do. But we all know that that can be undone by the very next guy, right? We can take, but you know, in terms of the expansion of rights to individuals, to marginalized groups that have been marginalized for our history, rarely do we allow them to shrink it back. Certainly, you know, we, when FDR expands uh, executive power, when FDR expands, expands the role of the federal government, it is pivotal, um, which is easier for me to say that time than it was the time before. But, um, we know that if someone comes into the Oval Office and other people get control of Congress, they can shrink that no problem. I, I, I would agree with you theoretically, Chris, mm -hmm. but it's now 2021. 
And it, the, the framework of the New Deal is still the very foundation of our governmental, you know. Well, I, uh, but I think the bookend to your uh, argument, Dave, and I actually agree, I, I would, uh, if somebody didn't raise the issue of New Deal, I would uh, have said it and not as well as you did. But I, I think the other pivotal uh, point is the Reagan revolution, because as I look at it now, it's almost as though um, in my uh, in mystical moments here, there's this uh, argument going on between the New Dealers and, and the, the Reagan folks. That's what's um, and so we've now seen the Reagan revolution unfold for 40 years, and it really is a rebuttal. I think to the New Deal Coalition and the Great Society uh, program. So, uh, it, and it's not so much a constitutional revolution; it's certainly a political revolution. But it's uh, using federalism for certain ends, whereas I think FDR used the principle of federalism for different, yeah. uh, used a different level of, of federal power for different ends. Whereas the Reagan Revolution is using power uh, to devolve that. So I, I would say the Reagan Revolution is as significant. Um, as as the New Deal revolution, uh, and and again, this is this is obviously a topic we could uh, you know debate and go on because I think I I would agree with you absolutely that that's another turning point is that you know you know it, it begins this discussion of is the New Deal going to uh, die a quiet death but and I do think it chipped away but the very core of the New Deal. The, the, the notion of federal power to intervene uh, and to act directly with both on the states and uh, with the people uh, in, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the creation of the administrative states is still with us. Sure. You know, the Reagan revolution to me never. But there's really tremendous, there's oh. tremendous blowback. Uh, I mean, let me graze my cattle. Don't tell me who to bake cakes for. Uh, don't regulate my swampland on the back 40. I mean, there's blowback to that administrative state. And I say that's the Reagan revolution. Yeah. And you're right. David, I think you're up, the, the New Deal, I think, is essential. And I agree with Tim. I think Reagan is the example of what we were talking about earlier. It's the starving of the beast. It's the starving of the state capacity, which I think is central. But I do want to point out, um, you said rights are overrated, right? And I know, I know how you were using that, but I just want... It's not because it's foundational, David, and I know you believe this because you do know that the New Deal policies that were so important were written in such a way that carved out exceptions for Black Americans and for women that were with us. Some of them are with us till today. Some of those are what LBJ tried to correct through Medicare and Medicaid, which then the Reagan revolution is a response to that. It's a response to using state capacity to actually come up with equitable policies to address our, our past. So I see, it, I see them all as linked. And I think if, if we had free and fair elections in the 1930s, I think the New Deal looks different. But because mm -hmm. Blacks weren't voting or FDR could count on just, you know, just certain blocks, I think you get different policies. So that's why I think it really is foundational to have all voices able to vote and why it's also super important to yeah. have have voting that is open as possible um, because I think that's where you get policy that represents more people. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, and I'm not in any way, I think both you and Chris are absolutely right. As far as those being major turning points, I just, part of me, again, given where our discussion had, 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 had been earlier, I just found it ironic that uh, you guys <laughs> are obviously reflections of a modern culture and it's all about rights. All right, and it's all about yeah, identity. modern. I went all the way back to 1868. That's really you know, uh, well, as, but at, as you said, it was a paper amendment uh, for so long, uh, and its life wasn't uh, breathed into it. Well, no, no. I hold on. I said, had they followed through on Reconstruction, the way the authors Howard and um, uh, uh, who's oh gosh, um, um, authors. Foner. I'm sorry, Foner. Foner. Oh no, Bingham. Bingham, Bingham and Howard, had we followed through with what they intended in 1868, we wouldn't have worried about redlining and the disenfranchisement that took place within the New Deal programs, right? Because we would have actually followed through on correcting uh, our biggest mistake, which is slavery. I, that's we, a fascinating, that's a fascinating hypothesis uh, there. 
uh, Mr. Kavanaugh, uh, and, and one that maybe we'll save until a later time, because, uh, you know, uh, the reason we didn't follow through is that it just wasn't possible unless we had another civil war. And I'll leave it at that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, again, you guys are lucky that we're all, all four of us are not in the same room because this thing could go on for another seven hours. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we, uh, we're going to bring this session to an end. Uh, we appreciate uh, your participation and uh, we look forward to talking to you uh, again. So uh, for uh, the four Bs, uh, peace, love, yogurt, tacos, bye-bye, bye-bye.